Dear happiness, where are you? I've been looking everywhere and all I see is people suffering. There's so much economic devastation and racial divides. I see a world that's torn apart by fear and isolation. And it looks like my heart. Then I see this book and I meet this thought leader. He's a doctor of happiness. Yeah, that's right, Dr. J. Kumar. His book is called The Science of the Brain and it shows us how to fight all the overwhelming struggles we have in a normal life, let alone this life. He has real answers and real actionable ways for us to heal. So don't miss the good doctor's experience and wisdom that's made him the most popular professor on campus in California. He's a guru of happiness, and this is his story. Welcome to Sip It On Stories, where we take you into the lives of diverse and unique change makers who turn anxiety, fear, and passion into powerful recipes for success. Good stories build insightful connections, but great stories. Now, that's something special. Today's story is one of those stories. Hi there, my name is Rose McInerney and today we're sipping on something super important. It's called happiness. Happiness is such a personal thing for each of us. It's a state of mind sometimes, it's a feeling, a sense of being, but it's also something that I know each of you are thinking an awful lot about these days. Um, it's hard to stay calm. It's hard to stay calm in the best of times. We know that all the numbers around the country tell us that people suffer from depression and thoughts about suicide in, a, in a, a typical average year. It might be one in 15 people that feel that way. And we know now that we add the layer of COVID on this, it's one in every four. One in every four, that's 25%. So that may be you. So let's talk about happiness. I don't wanna drag you down at the beginning because we're gonna have a little something to sip on first and you're gonna hear from someone that's going to make a difference in how you feel and how you see happiness. So getting into it, always when we have a change maker on the show, we ask them what they like to sip on. Uh, so Dr. Jay Kumar, who is the doctor of happiness, he's an actual doctor and he's a professor teaching out at a college in California. Um, he told me or he shared with me that he loves two things. The first one has a little bit of bubbly in it. It's champagne. Well, tonight I'm not doing a night taping, so I didn't break out the bubbly. Maybe I should have. Instead, I went for his tea, his preference in tea. And so he loves a tea that's Grand, grand Matcha tea. It's kind of like matcha tea, only it's a Japanese tea and it's made with an infusion or it's the seeping, I believe, of brown rice. And it has this nutty sort of flavor that I, of course, ran out to buy and try. I'm not a green tea fan, but this stuff is delicious. It's softer and uh, it makes me feel good drinking it. Not only that, of course, no surprise here, the doctor is recommending something that's super healthy. So I am going to raise a glass and tell you that I love this tea, Dr. Jay Kumar. It is um, Grenamacha tea. I know I'm slaughtering that name, but I, it's, it's really a terrific tea. Um, so get out there and explore purchasing a little bit of that. But more importantly, let's move into Dr. Jay's um, space and get a little bit of happiness uh, today. He is, of course, celebrated with his new book that was out at the beginning of uh, January, and he is now offering online courses for free on LinkedIn that you should be able to access. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce and get Dr. J here on video, and we will get started. Hi again, Dr. J Kumar. How are you today? It's Rose McInerney again. I suppose I should start from the beginning and just say, you know, I, I think it's important for people to understand what it is you do for a living because if you read the little bio here, it's like, what, a doctor of happiness? Does that really even exist? So I don't know, Dr. J, could you explain a little bit about what you do? 
<laughs> hey, Rose, it's great to be here. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, believe it or not, I am. You know, it's kind of funny. In high school and career counseling, there's no box for, you know, happiness doctor or professor of happiness. So, yes, I, I teach. Uh, I'm a director of, of well-being at Chapman University. I've also been teaching the happiness course for the past nine years and um, really kind of um, I'm known on campus as the happiness professor. So yes, that is correct. I am a doctor and professor of happiness. So uh, that's been really great in terms of um, uh, recognizing and helping to advance strategies and tools. So my professional and academic background really explores the brain science of happiness. Let's, let's see specifically where brain science then spiritual wisdom really begin to merge and help us to, um, you know, I think uh, develop practices and skill sets. So the book that I, that, that, that I just um, um, authored uh, this yes. year, Science of a Happy Brain, really like distills. It takes the reader as if the reader is in the happiness course. Right. And, and so when the book came out, when we met again in January, Lo and behold, you know, uh, who would have thought that my position at Chapman, being the director of well-being, would be so vital and so crucial right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a really great it's a really great um, opportunity for me to help others, right, arise right. And, and really begin to, um, I think, you know, embody these skill sets mm -hmm. yeah. that we can begin to do to cultivate and even find even in the midst of crisis yes. and change and turmoil. Where do we find that um, sense of resilience, that sense of meaning and purpose in our lives? Well, it's it's something I know when we when we first spoke too. I think the number of books published on the subject of happiness it is the number one sought after solution in bookstores and online. Um, people search happiness more than anything, and so you know, heading up this wellness center at Chapman, I feel like your your position um the the book itself the science of the happy brain you have a platform an opportunity in the world today for people that are hungrier or thirstier than ever to not just take these skills for our own lives you know because i know when we interviewed you know we talked last time about it was opioid addiction and depression and those kinds of things and and i think this is radically on on steroids right this is yeah. completely yeah. different um yeah. so 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 maybe we can so you're heading a wellness center and and um you've got some really amazing answers in this book i read through it twice i've shared it with people i cannot recommend it um enough um, and so we'll have plugs on the, on the website as well for people to, to, um, go ahead and, and purchase a copy of it. Um, it may very well be the best thing they do, um, <laughs> ever. Um, but, but maybe we can backtrack yet even a little bit more and talk about, um, you know, where, why the book happened. It's, it's, you know, like I said, something everyone thinks about, we want to be happy, but for you, I mean, you, you have a doctorate, like, how did you take this? Like, what the heck got you here? Yeah. You know, how'd you get here? Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about stories. So I think we learn from each other's stories in the book, um, science of a happy brain, not only does it, um, you know, reveal stories about average real day people and their struggles for happiness. It also, I've introduced the book with my personal story. Right. Um, and I talk specifically regarding my mother's uh, having died from suicide yeah. when I was in my um, um, mid-20s. And it was something completely unexpected, you know, and of all things, she was a psychiatrist, which I didn't think I revealed in the book. So no. this idea of, you know, um, prior to her, my mom's death, by, uh, death from suicide, I was always believed, taught to believe that happiness resides in performance, success, achievement. But I did all those things. And then this, you know, tragic event took place and it made me question mm -hmm. what really, I made me question a number of things. One is, what is the meaning of life? A very large question we all kind of have. Mm -hmm. But also mm -hmm. specifically, are we as a society or am I, am I specifically uh, pursuing the wrong constructs of happiness the wrong um you know i think right. not the wrong the wrong ideal of what happiness mm -hmm. is right. and so this my mother's um you know suicide in many ways became the 
uh, the catalyst, uh, you know, for me to go ahead and get my academic training in brain science and behavioral health and spiritual traditions. But it also really, I think on a personal level, um, I think uh, inspire motivated me to explore my own healing, right. to find my own sense of where do I begin to heal the pain. And so it's interesting right now where we are as a society, as a global uh, humanity, right. if you, will, you know, there are all these, uh, we're, we're in the midst of so much crisis and pain and turmoil. Yeah. But I think there's a metaphor here for the story that even in the midst of, like even in the depth of our pain and despair, there's always potential for growth and this really powerful opportunity to become whole, to heal. Right. You know, I like to say we're, you know, we talked at the uh, very beginning of how life has, is so different today than it was six months ago when we first met. And I think, you know, we're experiencing what I call the perfect stress storm. Yes. We've got COVID crisis. So that's a big mm -hmm. crisis. We also have a medical health crisis. Right. Many of us are experiencing an economic crisis. Yeah. And on top yeah. of that, there's a social racial crisis unfolding in this country, in America at least, but it's mm -hmm. it ripple effects mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. So isn't it, it's, it's no surprise that many of us are feeling more so than in just a few months ago, a higher level of anxiety, depression, despair. Mm -hmm. I read a report that in America at least, last year, one out of every 15 people reported depression. Today, it's one out yeah. of four. One out of four, so twenty-five percent of the population feels depressed. Is reporting depression, yeah. and anxiety, and and I don't know about you, but I've seen it with my friends. Yes, I've seen it with my friends that say, you know what, I just can't. You know, a, a few of them, I'm really having a hard time getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. um, how do I handle this? You know, what do I do? So I think you're right. It's really important to um, to point out that this is not a, a normal circumstance or situation at all, as we all know. Um, but in the depths of this, um, not only is there something good we can find, but I'm hopeful that we're going to come out better than where we were because it's all like lumped on heavy at the beginning, um, you know, of this, this phase now for us, it's going to be sustained. I don't think we're going to see any of, you know, COVID's not going anywhere. We're the economics. It looks like the government and the bailout, we're not going to get the same kind of stimulus plan again next time around, which is going to be, you know, more foreclosures, more people, um, you know, obviously not being able to pay their rent and the unemployment rate. And then we're seeing states have to backtrack, aren't we? Um, just with the whole health epidemic and, and, and you know, the pandemic. So I, I do think that this is unusual. And when we have a massive crisis, it's always a great time to wipe the slate clean and maybe fix what we didn't have right before. So, you know, if we didn't have any coping skills or anything. Um, so, and, and that kind of leads into this, okay, where do we, where do we begin? Um, you know, I want to get to the four C's. I know that those are important if you want to roll those out. Um, but where do we start? So I know that I'm having a hard time. Um, definitely I'm, if I'm connected to Rose or we've hear the sipping on stories, we're going to get your book, but what about those people that are in the dark and haven't heard, don't know about you, haven't found the answers they're looking for, or they're, they're afraid they're so immo uh, immobile that they can't even get to, to bring themselves to start searching. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Where do you start? Yeah. Well, these are all great questions, but I'm happy to, you know, explore and answer. I think you, know, you hit on something earlier uh, when you were saying that we'll come out the stronger. And it's true, if you look in biology, when a bone breaks, mm -hmm. if you break a bone, uh, the bone actually has, when it heals, it becomes stronger. And when it mends, it actually becomes more resilient right. to breaking again. So I find that from my personal story, I was broken after my mother's suicide. I was right. in the depth of my despair, but from that, I've grown the sense of resilience. And I feel like mm -hmm. I've now been able to so when a tragedy does occur, and this is the thing we also always always need to remember, mm -hmm. life there, life is going to throw you unexpected uh, tragedies. Uh, look at where yes. we are right now, right? And this really, I think, ties into two things I want to talk about, which I think is the starting point that goes into, I think, more the brain science, but also I think on the 
uh, you know, I think maybe you've come to that on like a, even like a, a spiritual level as well. The first thing is, what, I think that the reason why we're grieving so much, and I kind of was, had a hard time putting my finger on it until a few weeks ago when I realized all the things that we're experiencing uh, right now can really be boiled down to a sense of we're grieving from a sense of loss. Yeah. Couldn't agree and, more. <laughs> so that loss can manifest as physical loss. You lose a loved one to COVID, or which is real, or you lose um, a job, you know, or which are tangible. But think about these, like you know, intangible things that we've lost: a sense of hope, a sense of you know, it's summer here right now, and like you know, some vacations, planning. You know, I was supposed to have be with my family and friends, you know, over the summer uh, the, for for students going back to school. Uh, my university students, a sense of loss, or the students who weren't able to graduate with graduation ceremonies. Oh, you know? mm -hmm. So, so we're we're all grieving a loss of not just uh, a loss of you know tangible things. We're losing. We're what I'm finding is that this is I think the segue that I'll talk about. We're also are uh, experiencing is a loss of certainty. Yeah, and that's the biggest crisis because when we don't have a sense of certainty, when this is going to end. Something real happens in your brain, which is the segue for the four C's. We'll talk about kind of solution. Right. So the first thing I'll say is, if you're experiencing despair or depression or anxiety or just a deep sense of hopelessness, first thing to remember, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. Yeah. Don't ignore the or suppress them. Own it. At the same point, don't remember that these feelings are a barometer or a litmus test to help you recognize that you're in pain and you're in need of healing. That's a good point. Good so point. it's almost like when you hit your when you break your toe when you hit your toe on the door or step your toe, you your body produces pain. Right. So think of think of your mental or emotional psychic psychological pain as an instinctive way for your body to tell you or your being mm -hmm. to tell you that you're in pain and you need you need healing and support. Right. And so we can look at this from <clears throat> um, from the, the brain science perspective. Our brain evolved not to be happy. Our brain evolved for survival. Right. So what threatens survival? A lack of certainty. Yeah. <clears throat> what threatens survival is the lack of feeling that things are in control. So true. That sense of uncertainty is so scary. So the fear meter goes so way up and um if you spiral if you can't get yourself out of that and you focus on the insert the uncertainty it's really hard to find something to to put your feet on and feel like you've got a ground you've got some place to to rest maybe yeah mantra i i, I for in addition to you know um giving advice to the general public i'm also doing a chat in the university where I, you know, where I'm a director, a weekly podcast called the Healthy Brain, Healthy Mind podcast. Mm. And those are free, by the way. So I, I'll send a link okay. to you for those are those that I do one but every week. We're on episode 13 right now. Okay. Can we go back and say that name again? It's Healthy Brain. Healthy Mind. Healthy Mind podcast. And Perfect. it's on Facebook and it's on my, uh, I can, on my Facebook at Dr. J. Kumar on my social media as well. Okay. But one thing I, one of the first things I uh, did in that podcast was the, the titles, how do we learn to be adaptive, not reactive to change? Yes. That's the key. So our, it's instinctive. Our brain, the reason why I say our, your brain evolved for survival, not happiness is because in order to live another day, we had our brains had to evolve in such a way to be on the lookout for potential threats, right. for our safety, security, and stability, all the things I talked about, science of a happy brain. Mm -hmm. So the first, the first rule that's kind of maybe segues to the four C's, this is the thing I'll maybe share to people. If your outside world feels out of control, mm -hmm. learn to control your inner world. Oh, I like that. Okay. That's simple. Outside world feels out of control. Learn what you can control your inner world. You remember your thoughts, your mm -hmm. attitude, your emotions. It starts mm -hmm. from there because sometimes we can't, there are things which are completely out of control, like the weather. Sure. You can't control other people's behaviors. Mm -hmm. You can't control when this pandemic is going to end. No. But what can you control? Mm -hmm. You can control your response. Right. 
through these external situations? Yeah. Do you choose to respond with fear or anxiety or panic, which is instinctive and normal? Or can we rewire your brain, retrain your brain <laughs> to, to focus on those aspects which you can control? So this kind of segues into right. the four C's, what I call the four C's of happiness, right. the, the pillars of the book. So this is actually adapting. It means, I guess, that Netflix has to stop sometime <laughs> and we can't keep um, binging because, you know, I know that was a reality for me. And I mentioned that um, there was a little bit of an escape at the beginning where you thought this is awful. It's terrible, but I'll just kind of go into my happy place over here and I'll catch up. And if I don't think about it and I don't see it, then I don't really have to acknowledge it. Right. But what you're saying and what we're all feeling is, okay, we've done that. And not only are we running out of a lot of, you know, good stuff to watch anymore, maybe some of us have started some new habits. If we haven't that are healthy habits, this is the road to actually adapting and changing, taking control. Okay. All right. I'm with you. And there's, and there's a whole, there's a, there's a, a, a whole, everything I'm about to share with you, these strategies are proven brain science strategies okay. but the beauty about them is they also have what i call uh origins that maybe come from spiritual traditions as well so it's not just you're getting you know like empirical real clinical brain science you know strategies mm -hmm. I, I actually feel the reason why i advocate these four c's is because they definitely also have a spiritual you know i think component as well right. so the first thing is we call the four c's or comfort contribution connection and compassion, and they're all outlined in the book, Science for Happy right. Brain. The first uh, C is what I call comfort, which is more biological comfort. So think about what are those things, this ties into also what you can control. So I, right. I, one thing I've been doing for my, um, in my role at Chapman as Director of Wellbeing is telling students, even though life may no longer feel normal and life may feel disrupted because you're now learning through your remote learning and you're not yeah you're not with each other with yeah each other. so one thing i did to make sure that my students uh not just my personal because i took also the ten thousand students that i now have to be <laughs> responsible for at chapman um, is build routine mm -hmm. set regularity whatever that looks like for you so if you were if you're still remote working or if you're even if your kids are now home from Right. You know, they're on summer vacation right now. Mm -hmm. It's still very important to have a sense of routine regularity. Right. So trying to get up at, at the specific time of the day. Mm -hmm. If you if you if you know if you're living maybe the gym is is closed where you're living, it, it you can still maybe do you can still set aside the same time of your day or if you had a workout you did at the gym or did a class, make sure you carve out that same time right. for your you know um, workout. If your family would eat a certain time for dinner, make sure you ground it. These yeah. are, this is comfort. What it does is um, regularity and routine give us a sense of comfort. Right. Because it helps us get out of that distracted, uh, dysregulated <laughs> brain that wants to grasp onto the, the lack of certainty and the change and yeah. the tumult, if you will. But right. it says, okay, what what's one thing I can I can control? So mm -hmm. for you, for I'm saying you, the, the listener, yes. the person watching, yes. what's yeah, one small thing? What's one small thing you can do? You know, maybe right. maybe something as simple as um, making sure that you have a set time in your day when you just take time for yourself to sit outside on your back porch, maybe have your mm -hmm. cup of coffee, yeah, or just yeah. to take five deep breaths. I had a, I had, I had a, I had a <laughs> story, uh, and this may, be, this, this may be true for many listeners or people watching this. You might have a household, a household full of people, and it might be hard to get away. Yes. My secret is for those people, lock yourself in the bathroom for five minutes and just deep breathe. <laughs> you know, that's that's not bad. My house here uh, on the the northeast is is full. Yeah, I mean, we have so many people and getting time out is really, really hard. Um, so I hear what you're saying about just locking yourself into some place. Yeah, um, for just five minutes and just breathe. Yeah, yeah. That could be. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So comfort, comfort can also mean also making sure 
we get our proper sleep and routine yeah. and diet. I think it's really key. I think there's a whole episode we can just, or there's actually an episode I've done on my Healthy Brain, Healthy Mind podcast, how sleep, what I call it, take your meds, M-E-D-S, meditate, exercise, diet, sleep. <laughs> wow. Okay. I fall take down really bad on the, on the S part on the sleep, but okay. Yeah. You know, meditate. It's, it's, meditate exercise diet and sleep and i gotta say nice. i wish i could take credit for that it's my um dear friend gopi kalayil who wrote the forward to the book who is the chief okay. brand officer of google okay. uh who told me that he says Smart. take your meds dr j every day that's so, awesome so okay. so even if you do one of those if you can maybe just meditate just don't you yeah. have to do all five all four no, no maybe just make sure you got enough get your seven eight hours of sleep right Make sure you're getting your exercise, whether that's mm. just maybe 20 minutes a day of walking in nature. Yeah. So Meditate. easy steps. Yes. Yeah. Just one. One minute of breathing. Yeah. Yeah. We can all do that. We can Honestly, all. we can all do that. That's doable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so comfort is more biological. Right. But the, four, the second C is what I call contribution. Mm -hmm. And just remember that even though you may not have a sense, you know, this may be really also true for many of us who may have found or find ourselves being unemployed. Mm -hmm. um, it can be very psychologically devastating yeah. when we get the sense that what we're doing in the world is not, we're, we don't feel valued or a sense of belonging or a sense of engagement. I think one of the deepest fears we have as human beings, mm -hmm. I'll say this, I think that the brain science affirms this, is the fear of being unneeded. True, true. We're disposable in some way. No one's going to even notice if we're not there. Yeah. So Very many people true. who are feeling that, especially if you've been recently unemployed or, um, you know, had your job terminated, it, you can feel psychologically devastated in the sense of not feeling needed. So I'm going to just maybe say to you, where where can you maybe find a sense of contribution? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where can you maybe find that sense of value and meaning? I'm yeah. finding that a lot of my, um, I do know some people who have been recently, you know, found themselves to be unemployed and it's devastating. I mean, the, the, the psychic or the emotional psychological fear is real. Right. Right. So I'm not saying don't deny that. I'm not yeah. in any way trying to belittle that sense of feeling mm -hmm. panic or fear around not having income. What I'm saying is let's actually understand that there's, even though we do need money in our life to live, Let's also think, determine what is what brings you meaning in your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe start from there. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's trying to find some way to take one first step. It is. Just yeah. grab anything out there. And life is sort of surprising this way, isn't it? That there are opportunities if we're really looking. There are. There are. I mean, you know, there are a ton of people that are sharing and doing really good things to help each other. I've got a friend that's like she's created a, a, a little business on delivering pizzas to hospitals. It's crazy. Amazing. And she's made all these new friends. Her sense of well-being, having lost her job, is completely 180 now. I mean, she's feeling good and really thinking about all the skills she's gaining in this and, and managing now drivers and all kinds of stuff that she never thought she would do. Right, so, right. So, you know, in right. crisis can come an opportunity when that proverbial phrase, when a door closes, another one opens. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is very true in many ways, but, you know, I don't want to diminish the uh, necessity, you know, we need for having employment right. and money and income. Right. But I'm also, what I'm really trying to maybe for around contribution is recognize you are defined more than just your material wealth. Mm -hmm. You are defined more by the contribution you bring to the world. And that can be something as simple as I'm a stay at home mom and right. I'm taking care of my kids right now because that's what all I can do. Mm -hmm. Or I may, uh, you know, I'm working from home right now. I may not have the sense or maybe I'm, I am unemployed. Right. Can I maybe volunteer my time, maybe not physically in a place because of COVID. Is there maybe mm -hmm. can I volunteer my time doing something online sure. for a cause? Yeah. Your expertise in some area. Right, right. Right. So the thing that I'm doing, which is contribution, I mean, I'm very grateful to you know, have employment and very busy. But one thing that gives me, and this is something really simple, at be, being an educator, mm -hmm. I have, I don't, I don't have kids of my own, but I have a, a, a nephew and niece who are twins. Okay. Who are seven and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And as like many students around the world, they had to have their education disrupted. And right. I made a point saying, they call me Unky. <laughs> I do one hour of tutoring with them 
Oh, terrific. Every day, every weekday. Right. To make sure that they are on track, you mm. know. And what it does, okay. it's contribution because it's helping someone I love, these my nephew and niece, it's yeah. for their education. But interestingly enough, it also gives my sister-in-law <laughs> a break, uh, a break. A break. <laughs> the yeah. Two, one to two hour break she needs to get her yeah. stuff. Yeah. She can go for that walk or have her um, yeah, sense exactly. of you know, self-love, right. Or just breathe, go in the bathroom and breathe for an yeah. hour. Yeah. Yeah. That it's a wonderful perspective to see it as that, to see it as comfort, find a way to contribute. Um, I've always believed too, we are not, uh, who we are is not defined by our job. It's the skills and the experiences and all those things we bring. Um, even though we depend on jobs for, for, you know, food on the table and to pay our bills. Um, we may surprise ourselves. So maybe being open is, again, you know, one of those things. Find where okay. you bring value to the world. Great. So you are needed. This is the third C, so called the social as, which is connection. Yes. So important when we're social, when we're physically isolating and distancing from each other. Mm -hmm. So people might wonder, you know, if, if there's one thing I advocate in the book, Science of a Happy Brain, about the, the brain science research, which I think is, is the most powerful a new revelation to come out of brain science research is that the human brain fundamentally evolved as a social organ for right. community, for belonging, and for connection. So you might wonder why that is. Think about it this way. You know, I always like to use this as an example. Imagine yourself going back in time 10,000 years ago to our ancient, you know, Stone Age tribe ancestors. <laughs> Life was pretty brutal, pretty harsh. Yeah. It, yeah. You're definitely. all by yourself and you're cold, you're tired, you're hungry, and all you want is a, a cave, some warm fire, and some food Someday. to make it one more day. Right. Happiness in 10,000 years ago was survival, living one more day. Yeah. So would your chances for survival to make it one more day increase if you had one other able-bodied person that you trusted? Well, the mm -hmm. answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Imagine you had five or 10, 50 right. other people looking out for you, you looking out for them. Mm -hmm. You now have the basis of what we call tribe. Right. So this is something that's really fascinating that just found out the brain science research, and there's a lot of it in the book. I won't go into the neuroscience behind it, but this is maybe an easy way of thinking about it. We humans are not the fastest of animals. We're not the strongest. We can't, no. we can't breathe underwater. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can't fly naturally. We can't, you know, not the tallest. Right. So what is it that made humans the predominant species on the planet? The answer is our ability to form into complex social networks. And the brain evolved to navigate a complex social terrain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strength and in numbers. Strength, strength in numbers. numbers. Solidarity, social solidarity. And so the one brain science piece they found out is that there are areas of your brain that process physical pain. Like you right. break a bone, you, you know, hit your head against the wall by accident or something. Mm -hmm. Your brain registers that pain. What they found in this bit of research, and it's more detailed in the book, the same, the same, there are overlapping regions of your brain that process social pain. So when you are, you got dumped by your, you got separated sure. or you got, or you lost your job or mm -hmm. you're because of COVID, you have to be, you have to. Socially, you're isolating. Isolate. Yeah. You're distancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they discovered is that that social pain registers and process and regulates in the same overlapping regions of the brain as physical pain. Right. Physical pain and social pain are all the same in your brain. Pain is all the same in your brain. Pain, yeah. <laughs> okay. So like if you haven't called your mother or you haven't done those things that you should be doing, you know, I have some friends that send a little text in the morning. Yeah. Have a great day. And I know they're thinking about me. Yeah. So what I say, take your vitamin S, vitamin social. Okay. Okay. Take your, your daily. So for connection, you need mm -hmm. to take your daily, you need to get your daily dose of vitamin S, vitamin social. Right. And mm -hmm. even though you might be living with other people, you know, that's social right there. But people like myself, you know, who live alone or, you know, who've had to, it's been really difficult, you know, for many of us yeah. alone during yeah. COVID. But the one thing that has sustained me is knowing that even though I'm physically isolated from others, right. I am socially connected through, it may not be the same as having a physical touch or being in real time, 
but right. we have technology technology thank god <laughs> uh, it, it is going to save yes. grace for many of us yeah. to stay connected whether mm -hmm. through work one thing i do for sure i facetime with my parents in chicago whom you met yes you know my dad nice. is a new fitness partner yeah. you know so i make sure that i i, I check in with them Mm -hmm. every day i've got my little nephew and niece that i you know do good. My tutoring and, with and but like you i just do a simple text message to a friend hey yeah. what are you up to thinking about you yeah. or here's a face here just on facebook hey i like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. simple. anything yeah in some ways i'm connecting more with some people than i have in the past you know uh, and and I think to your point, we do crave this. We need this, and it doesn't have to be something where it's another checklist thing, and you're feeling overwhelmed by, you know, maybe what you aren't able to do as much as the things you want to do that you have this time. Um, you're right; it doesn't have to be a, a big deal, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and seeing it, seeing it in small. All right, and what's that last big C? The last one is compassion. Oh, I love this well, one. Compassion. So, you know, we can just have a whole show on that, but compassion really is like recognize and understand something. We're witnessing a lot of division, a lot of, um, you know, I think um, factionalism in the world right now, especially mm -hmm. in our country in America here. Yes. But there's something to remember. There's far more that unites us than divides us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are wired for empathy and compassion. Yeah. We are wired for, it's, you know, like I say, uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin, he wrote his famous words. He actually, his, 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 his research kind of got a little, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. it wasn't, he wasn't advocating survival of the fittest, yeah. it's survival of the kindest. Oh, well, that's a different take on it altogether. Different take altogether. It's not the struggle. It's like, it's not a struggle for survival. It's the snuggle for survival. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's how I look at it. It's the snuggle for survival. We need, we are yeah. wired for empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And there are systems in the brain that uh, instinctively want us to reach out to others in times of crisis. True. And so I say, you know, I say stay, you know, make, how do we make kindness contagious? It actually was my the last title of my last, my most recent podcast for the healthy brain, healthy mind is Love make it. contagious. Yeah. And being kind to others start to be kind to yourself mm -hmm. yes. learn how to be kind to your mind mm -hmm. do things that you know are kind to you don't beat yourself up don't mm -hmm. over judge yourself don't go into the sense of woe is me yeah learn to be kind to yourself do do something that's kind for you but then also recognize kindness actually has a ripple effect and so the one thing i'll say is that they've done studies that have shown if you do an act of kindness Something as simple as opening the door yes. for someone or like even like just saying hello and saying thank you to the cash register at right. the market for all the great work they're doing. Mm -hmm. The mail person who is risking his or her life, you know, just getting the mail out there. Yeah. A simple thank you recognition. Mm -hmm. And what they find is that the recipient of that act of kindness is now more inclined to an act of kindness next hour. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine a world where we did this? I know. Or if I see you doing an act of kindness, I'm not the recipient. Yes. Even if I see you, Rose, do an act of kindness to someone else, just seeing that inclines mm -hmm. me, the, the, the person who sees it, True. to do an act of kindness. So kindness has a ripple effect. We make kindness contagious. Well, and, the, and on a very physical level, too, when I go somewhere and I'm thanking someone, and you see their response and they're maybe they're surprised, but they're happy that you said something, you in turn feel good. Like I feel good afterwards. So even if I said it to five different people and maybe only three answered, I feel good. So there's some kind of chemical, something that happens in here or that oh, yeah. turns on right in my yeah. brain that that is a healing process. Yeah. In there's oxytocin way. and there are other uh, dopamine they get right. released into your body right. when you do so it's yeah. what they're finding the last kind of from what you're saying it's not just the recipient of kindness the agent of kindness so you the one doing mm -hmm. the act of kindness actually they've done studies have found that people who are more kind and altruistic live longer they mm -hmm. have higher immune systems okay and they're more mm -hmm. uh they're less susceptible to anxiety depression um there's something innately biologically rewarding 
Wow. For the brain and your body when you act out of kindness, more so if you act out of hostility. That's that's amazing. I, I'm going to use this one on my husband and tell him if he performs more acts of kindness and goes to get me tea during the day and other things that he's going to live longer. He'll he'll like that. <laughs> wow. Um, so so what happens from here now? Um, is school going to open in the fall? Are you? That's a big unknown. It's unlikely. We're it's July. It's late July right now. We have a month yeah. left. As of now, I'm in Southern California, so it might be different where you are. Right. But universe, my uni- Chapman University, we're, we're not looking You're like waiting. we're coming back to campus. But mm-hmm. all the more reason why I've got to develop a whole repertoire of wellness and well-being programs for all the students, which is keeping me busy. You are going to be busy. But yeah. there's something also exciting I want to share with uh, other people. In addition to the ah, book, Science okay. and Brain, that came out in uh, early this year, I just, I, I, I've created a new online course called Investing in Happiness. Oh, love it. For the corporate world, business, work, but also for life. Mm-hmm. It just uh, got accepted on the LinkedIn Learning. Okay. Uh, so it will be available probably, probably by the time when this uh, podcast is, uh, debuts. Very uh, nice. Debuts. In September. So, yeah. September. yeah. The, so you can look out for this uh, new online course called Investing in Happiness. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. And it's going to be on LinkedIn Learning or my website, drjaykumar.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. And those are going to be more opportunities for people. I, I thought I was asked to do this online course specifically to take the principles of Science of a Happy Brain, but apply them specifically into the business working world. Yeah, I, I love that because leaders are struggling. Leaders. You yeah. know, leaders are struggling. We're trying to figure out, you know, how do we come to terms with so many things, whether it's the health issues and opening an office to you know the racial divides what have we been how have been we've been doing business what is systemic in here that we've got to change and look at how do we how do we look deeper but then i think leading others um you know this is this is a a critical thing we look to our leaders for direction and advice and hands-on tools um you know, I, I saw today that Google is not opening now. They have officially, they've come out as the first, um, you know, company to say it's, we're not coming back until July of 2021, if that. So I think your online course is going to be a smash hit. I am definitely going to check it out. And we will have all these links, Dr. J, to your transformative leadership. You, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, not just for coming on and sharing with everyone, but for doing the, the act of kindness, for giving of yourself, for sharing so openly. Um, that encourages all of us to feel like maybe we can too, when somebody else is brave enough. So thank you so much. I don't know. Is there any, are there any takeaways, Dr. J, that I've missed <laughs> that, you know, maybe a, a light of affirmation, you know, Sure. Never always be uh, courageous to let your light shine forth fully and brightly because yeah. the world would be much different place without you in it. The yeah. more you let your light shine forth, together we illuminate the past or by the future. Oh, I love that. Okay, we might have to circle back and put that up as well. I know I've been using the uh, just the narrative that when things are cracked, it lets the light in. So it's a nice way of seeing something broken that's more than fixable. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. And we look forward to having another conversation again. Please, I love to do this. Okay. Reports out. All right. Okay. Have a great day there in sunny California and uh, all the best to you with everything. Thank you, Rose. And thank you for this opportunity. Wow. Okay. Follow up to Dr. J. Uh, there are going to be a, a long, there's going to be a long laundry list of links for you to follow. Um, you heard it from the doctor. There are so many things we can do not to feel, uh, that we are helpless, that we have to be really dependent on when is COVID going to be over? When can I take my mask off? Uh, when will the world return to what it used to be? Uh, we are definitely grieving. I think we are grieving for so many different things, whether it's job, um, you know, loss, the life that we had before, the loss of security. There were so many pearls of wisdom in Dr. J's sharing with us today. Um, I can't stress 
um, you know, really loudly enough for you to um, go to his website, um, take a look at his book, The Science of the Happy Brain. It's Dr. Jay Kumar, and it's K-U-M-A-R. Um, he talks about comfort, he talks about contribution, he talks about connection, and also compassion. Compassion is a, a, a favorite one of mine. I think all of those things come together because when we come together, we are better. It's, uh, it's a, a, might seem like an overused tagline that we are better together, but I think if nothing else, Dr. J shows us that this is true and can be true if you're in a place that um, you need to lift yourself out of or help somebody get out of. So I want to thank you all for listening today, um, spending time with us on Sipping on Stories. Uh, don't forget to go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us a five-star rating if you can. It'll encourage other people to come and visit us. And look at our follow-up website, sippingonstories.com, and we'll have all those links for Dr. J there. In the end, here's what we want. We want you to enjoy life. We want you to live it well. And we want to make sure that you take every last sip that you can to have your best life. Know always that you are loved, that you matter, and that we look forward to hearing and uh, from all of you and seeing you again next time on the next episode. Take care, everyone. Bye for now. <music>